Thank you for the questions. Um, I'm here in my office in Stockholm and I'm going to answer them one by one. But many of you actually put several questions, so then I had to pick one of them. The first one is from number one. What in your mind is the number one lesson to be learned from your way of looking at data? What ought our governments do that they are not doing? Well, it's clearly to collaborate better. The world is coming together, whether you call it globalization or whatever, and we need a better global governance. And by the end of the year, the first test for a hope for change is the climate negotiations in Copenhagen. Let's see if we will do better than last time. Number two, Ruben Sandwich. If you could present your stats to a panel of any five people in the world, who would you choose and why? Oh, that's an easy one. I would choose President Lula, President Putin, President Jintao, Prime Minister Singh and President Zuma. That is, the leaders of Brazil, Russia, China, India and South Africa. The leading emerging economies and the middle income countries that today constitute about 3 billion of mankind, half mankind. I think those are the most important leaders because they must on one hand establish good and uh, productive relations with the high income countries that were used to determine everything in this world. And on the other hand, they have to act decently and make good investment in the poorest countries. The investments from China and India and Brazil in the poorest countries in Africa are very hopeful if they are managed correctly. So it's those future leader of the world from the big nations that I would love to present to. Number three, Universal Sprout asks, in my experience, people do not understand statistics and will never change their opinion based on statistics. I would like to ask if you agree. No, I don't. But statistics has to go together with other information and with experience. That's when it's useful. I'll give you one example. If I search Google in the United States for unemployment rate, this is result. And if I click in the one box here, I will get a new type of graphics showing the unemployment rate for United States from 1990 and onwards today to an all time high on 9.7%. I think most people in the United States understand this curve because it relates to them and they are very keen to see whether it will turn around and they would also like to see how the unemployment have hit different parts of the countries. So they can go here and they would look for California and see that California today actually has a higher unemployment than the average of the country. It's all the way up to 12.1. And, 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 and some of you perhaps are, perhaps are interested of Silicon Valley. So then we open California here. We go down to uh, Santa Clara County. And Santa Clara County, look historically, they were lower than the average in the 90s. But in the dot com bubble burst in 2002, unemployment rate skyrocketed to 9.1%. But today it is higher. You see, if you present and make statistics accessible in this way, then many will start to use it. And it will be very interesting now to get the August figures for United States as a whole and the different countries to see whether the present crisis have come to a plateau or whether it is already starting to go down or continuing to rise. People are not stupid. They'll understand statistics and they will use it if it's made available in, in relevant and interesting ways. Number four, Rags729 asks, what is the most startling or intriguing correlation you have encountered by playing with different values on the X and Y axis at gapminder.org? Well, it's not really the correlation, but it is what we can do with animation, the trends, the change over time. That has been most startling to me. And the fact that the middle income countries are catching up so fast. Let me show you a classical example. Here in Gapminder World, I show total fertility rate on this axis. 
I show life expectancy on this axis. Uh, and 1800, United States had an estimate, these are rough historical estimates, of seven children per woman. And the life expectancy was just 39 years. Those were rough times. And if I move United States forward, what really happens was that family size started to decline. And with industrialization, life expectancy started to increase. It got better and better, progress in medical science and health service. And after the First World War and after the Second World War, there was a baby boom. And that was 1950. 1950, United States had about three children per woman and 68 years. Huh? Typical for part of the Western world. Now I'll compare that with Vietnam, which I find down here. That's where Vietnam was 1950. And I'll compare it with Iran. two prominent middle-income countries with special relationships to the United States. And I could say quite reliable data. I know the professionals in these two countries personally that are compiling uh, this data. So Vietnam had five children per woman and 39 years, like United States 150 years ago. Iran 1950 was almost like 200 years ago in United States. And now come my message. Look how they have catched up. In the last 50 years, really the last 25 years, they have catched up like this. And today they are just about one generation, half a generation of the United States when it comes to size of family and length of life. This is what have amazed me more, that really the world is converging, as Jeff Sachs says. It is getting more and more similar by this middle three billion people when it comes to human resources and family life. They are catching up. This surprised me when I got the data so clear in front of me. Number five, Kun John. What do you think of the state of statistics education in high school and college? Well, I can't think so much because I don't know it in detail. But I have a hope, and that is that the ability to play computer games and the ability to develop interesting tools in Flash can now be used in school. But an obstacle is that many schools block the downloading and installing of, of, of Flash readers. So, there must be another attitudes in school so that students and teachers can access freely the internet. Let there be flash in schools and statistics will be fun. Number six, Gerskerski. Would you be willing to help the White House present the health care budget in such a way as to make it easier for the average person to understand the value of public option or a single payer plan. Well, I'm willing, but I don't know if I'm able because there's been a blockage in the United States regarding discussion of the health system. Let me show you a graph. Look at this graph. At the horizontal axis, I show health spending per person in purchasing power dollars, that is comparable dollars between countries. The size of East Bubble is the size of the population of the countries. And here we have life expectancy, the length of life, the outcome of health service. And there is a color here also showing something. It is the percent of the gross national product that is used for health service. United States is hot and red with 15% of the national income being used for health service. All other countries in the world use less for health service, except one little friend of the United States down there. Huh? Which one is this? It's East Timor. There's only two countries in the world that use more than 15% of their national income for health service. United States and East Timor stands out as an exception. But neither of the two managed to achieve especially good uh, health in relation to the investment. And, 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 and we are also surprised outside the United States that, that, that uh, President Obama's health plan is regarded as communist or socialist. United States can compare with a country like Switzerland. 
Switzerland use 11% of its national uh, gross national product for health. And they achieve 82 years of life expectancy. United States use 15% and achieve 78 years. And United States, it's, you don't have to, to do like, like Mike Moore and compare United States with Cuba. There are so many countries today that use much less money for health but achieve the same result. Here Chile, here Costa Rica, here Singapore, here South Korea, here Portugal, and down here we have uh, Denmark. There are many, many countries that use less money with the same result. And it's strange, United States that is such a competitive country, so good in sport, so entrepreneurial, so good in film and everything. It seems United States don't want to compete in, in healthcare. It must be very sad to be the last in the world in using dollar well for health. I think it, this notion has to change in the population of the United States, but I don't know if I'm the person to help in that. If I could, I will. Number seven, Playerin asks, do you think CUDA is an important step in the path of better and richer visualization of data? But dear Playerin, look at me. Do I look like a person who know what CUDA is? I never heard the term. Do I look like a person, 61 year old, who can write codes? I've never written code. People have given me credit for developing software where I only have expressed the need for the software and have been a keen user. Uh, the Gapbinder software was developed by my son and his wife and a growing team of uh, flash developers in Sweden that now has moved to Google and now I work together with another team here in Gapminder Foundation that developed the stuff that I use in the lectures. Uh, don't give too much credits of older males, you know. They often hasn't done everything you think they have done. Pepper, what are your future plans for Gapminder? It is very clear to maintain the users we have and continue with a steady increase, but also specifically to develop tools that are suitable for teachers and students in education. Later this year, we will add a part of our webpage called For Teachers, and there you will get goodies that you can use in education regarding the major global development trends. Uh, make that gospel known around the world that Gapminder will provide stuff for schools. Number nine, Border Groves asks, what can be done to encourage governments and international organizations to more actively and effectively collect and publish vital statistics? It's easy. The World Bank, the OECD, the FAO, the IMF should do as President Obama is doing. He nominated the chief information officer, Vive Kundra that started the site data.gov and made the data freely available in both visualization and, this is important, as data sets that could be freely downloadable in relatively uniform format and, and partly machine readable so that others, companies, civil society organizations could innovate and make the data available for special groups in new visual ways. This is the way to go forward. Let the data that has been paid for by taxpayers be freely available in ways that complement what government is doing with the data. 10a, fat like Buddha. But how do you recommend that I or we help the bottom billion? I'm wondering about practical ways the top billion can assist the bottom billion with small units of organization. Well, it's good that you're using the new term, bottom billions. That was launched by um, Paul Collier, the professor of economics in Oxford, in this book. And I strongly recommend you to also read Paul Collier's last book. Sometimes you have to read books also, not only Reddit and, and, and TED videos. Huh? Paul Collier has written Wars, Guns and Votes. This is really about the poorest one billion people in the world. 
Let me show on these graphics who they are. This is income per person in dollars per day. And, and this was 1970. What has happened in the world is that population has grown and many people have moved out of poverty, but just a little bit. And now in 2008, this is more or less where the world is. The bottom billion is the people living here still on less than one dollar a day. And many of them are living in civil war, like in Afghanistan, Somalia, or in very fragile states that are almost falling down into civil wars. On the other side of the line, you find countries like Tanzania, Zambia, Cambodia, that has come out of, uh, of deep poverty and now start to move on. That's another situation. And then here in the middle, you find what we call middle income economies like Vietnam, Egypt, uh, and Peru that are now doing well and are progressing forward, but with great inequity still within countries. Now you need different forms of support for different countries. The bottom billion need humanitarian aid. So the answer on my question is Red Cross, Médecins Sans Frontières and similar humanitarian organization on one hand. On the other hand, wise and careful security operation led by the United Nations. Those have to be combined and then help good national leaders to move their countries into a more stable situation. That has happened in countries like Mozambique and Cambodia. And when we come on the other side of this line, then microcredits becomes more important, but also long-term aid for health, like vaccination, for education, for infrastructure, and then countries must have a fair trade situation in the world. So humanitarian aid on this side, microcredits on this side, and support to education, health, and infrastructure. Number 10b, stranger to love. What's it like knowing so many on Reddit have intense nerd crushes on you? It's wonderful, but it's also a challenge. It's mainly a challenge. How can we make information about the world even better available? And how can we reach the many with what we have already succeeded with? This is what we are trying now with a small team at Gapminder Foundation. We try to do our best and we are very interesting to get your comments and to have your help to let more people know about our services. Thank you very much.